Welcome to Soul Adventure TV, where we explore what may very well be an unprecedented opportunity in humanity's spiritual and physical evolution, and the choices standing before each and every individual to walk on this grand adventure or not. Do we really know who and what we are and what we can choose to be? I'm your host and fellow soul adventurer, Steve Crow. Today we have with us hypnotherapist and spiritual researcher Dolores Cannon, author of 17 books and publisher of over 60 other titles through her company Ozark Mountain Publishing. She also has a very successful counseling and hypnotherapy practice from which she draws the amazing and detailed information found in her books. Dolores' writing covers such diverse topics as reincarnation, UFOs and extraterrestrials, 2012 and the New Earth, parallel universes, and multi-dimensions. So, it's with great pleasure that I welcome to Soul Adventure TV our very special guest, Dolores Cannon. Hi, Dolores. Hello. Thank you Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to begin by asking you about the sources uh, of the information uh, that, that is found in your book. Where does that I information come from? Okay, a lot of people have always thought I was a psychic and I was channeling, and that's not what it is at all. All of my information comes from my clients that I work with. And I've been doing the hypnotherapy in the past life regression for 45 years. I began when there wasn't any such thing. Nobody knew anything about it. Nobody knew about reincarnation. They didn't know about medicine. There was no metaphysics. There was no new age, nothing. And I began in the 1960s. So I've been doing it a long time. And as it evolved, that's why they consider me like a pioneer because there was nobody to tell you what to do or to teach you what to do if you're just starting all this out. But I'm known for my curiosity. So I'm always curious and want to know more. And that's why I keep asking questions and I get more information. But it started back that far. But it was not until the 1970s is when I began really seeing clients. And it was past life regression. And I had to invent my own technique because there wasn't anything out there to do it with. The thing, though, with me is that I've stumbled across what I call the greatest power in the universe, and that's what I work with. And it began to come in slowly during all the years I was working, and I didn't even know what I was working with. I just know it had a lot of knowledge. But it began coming through my clients and supplying the answers. Also, with this, we can have instantaneous healing in one session. So that's my main focus now, and I'm teaching it all over the world. But as it began to develop, I found a way to call this in so we could help the person. And I call this the subconscious, what I was talking to, but it's not the subconscious the way it's defined by the psychiatrist. That's the childish part of your mind. That's the part of your mind that the hypnotist uses for habits, stop smoking, lose weight. What I found is much, much greater than that. I call it the greatest force in the universe. The source of all knowledge has all answers. But if you want to define it, you might say it's the higher self, the older soul, the higher consciousness. Some people call it the universal consciousness. But it's so big and so huge, it has, you can answer anything. And that's where the questioning becomes the most important thing. You don't ask the questions in the right way, you're not going to get the right answers. So the questioning becomes an art in this work. So the past life information, that's also coming from the super conscious or subconscious, as you call it, uh, source? Well, we always begin with the past life in my therapy. People come to me with all kinds of problems. And I find out by taking them through a past life first, we get some of the answers. But we don't get all of the answers. That's the very, very beginning, the tip of the iceberg. From there, we go to them 
and then they supply the rest of the answers. But it's, you see, I work at the deepest possible level of trance, which is called the synambulistic level. At that level, you block out the conscious mind, because the conscious mind, I, I don't know if I like it when I say this, it's the stupidest part of the human being. <laughs> It thinks it knows everything, it wants to be in control of everything, but it doesn't know anything. So you have to get that conscious mind out of there so they can come in and supply the answers. It's like when you're doing meditation. When you're first beginning to do meditation, the old conscious mind is in there, jabber, jabber, jabber. There's a hundred different things you need to be doing besides sitting here doing nothing. That's the conscious part. So with this technique I developed, we get that out of there so it can't interfere with what we're doing. And then this allows them to come in, and it's amazing because it's always the same through thousands of people. Hmm. It always speaks the same, the same terminology, the same uh, wording. And well, then we can get anything we want. What have your sources uh, told us, told you co concerning the true nature of humanity? I, I guess I would ask it this way. Are we who and what we think we are? No. <laughs> <laughs> what? There's a little tip of the iceberg of what you think you are. <laughs> what, what are we? Well, you're not a body, that's for sure. You have a body. Your real you is a spirit, a soul, that has been around forever and will continue to be around forever. And it's constantly going from place to place to learn lessons. The earth is a school. And as they said, it's the most difficult school in the whole universe. The earth is the most difficult planet to live on. It's so dense and heavy. And when you come to Earth, when the soul decides to come to Earth and have lessons and join in the Earth school, they say you're very brave and they admire you because they know this is a very difficult school to be in. But when you come to Earth and join in the Earth school, this is a long school. You'll be here for many, 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 many lifetimes before you finally finish and graduate. Ah, that's get out until you've learned all the lessons and graduate. That's very, that's very interesting. I think we're going to come back to that point. But the important thing is you are here to learn lessons and to develop your soul. And you can't do it in one lifetime. So you have to go through many lifetimes, each time a different lesson. But all this in a body is, is a vehicle. It's a suit of clothes, a costume that you're wearing for whatever part you're going to play in this lifetime. So when you die, you just get another suit of clothes. Now, so, now your sources have, have, have talked about how the human body form, the suit, as you were just calling it, is the result of genetic manipulation by very, very ancient extraterrestrials. Um, the question I have is, what kind of human beings were these ETs trying to create? Or, or was the point more just to create life in general on our planet, and humans were just one of the outcomes of that effort? Well, you you got to remember, they were under instructions on what to do. And this is what they do all over the galaxy. Search out planets that are ready to support life because they have histories in the, what they call the, um, it's a lot of councils that have histories and they keep records and that's where all the rules and regulations come from. And they know by exploring the galaxy, which planets are ready to support life. And the conditions are right. The primeval soup has to be right. You know, the atmosphere, thing has to be cooled down. All that has to be done before life can ever be formed. So they keep records of this, and they said when a planet reaches a point, it can support life at the very important point in the history of that planet, and it's given its life charter. Then these different ETs, that is their job, come to, say to Earth, 
and introduce single-celled organisms just to get something going. It doesn't matter what it is as long as life will begin to form in some way. And they said, you'd be surprised what you could have looked like. <laughs> it's just whatever will grow in this atmosphere. That's why all over the universes, there are all types of life forms. The humanoid shape with the head, the torso, and the two arms and legs is the most popular because it's very uh, useful, it's very convenient. So that is the most popular style. But then the way the person would look would be different depending on where they are. And I've explored this. I've had so many people go back to different life forms on other planets. But it doesn't matter as long as the soul is in it, it is alive. That's why I never understand why people are afraid of ETs, because they're just another life form that we all uh, experience at all our different times in our own Earth school. But they introduce life to see what's going to happen. And they, they wanted to, the single cells, to multiply into multi-celled organisms just to get something going. And they're constantly coming back and keeping records what's growing, what's not growing, the different things that are happening. And they said, you have no idea how fragile life really is. Many times they would get something going, developing into multi-celled organisms. They'd come back to check on it, and it has fallen apart, and the planet is lifeless again. Then they have the decision, go back to the council, what do we do? Do we introduce life again, or do we just let it be a dead planet? So see, it's not easy. No, no. But Earth, Earth was fertile enough that it took off, and it took one of them to be millions of years of watching and taking care of us. That's well, why they're called watchers. I've heard from other sources that um, that they may have been trying to create something pretty spectacular. Um, I, I've heard mention of an experiment to see if divinity could be held in physical form at the 3D level. And that's part of what they were trying to do with the humans on, on planet Earth. Does that ring a bell with you, or does that sound off the wall? Uh, or? <laughs> that doesn't sound right, because divinity can't exist at the 3D level. This is humans here. When you get to divinity, you don't have a body anymore. That you are a light being, and you have no reason to have a body. You have gone into the other dimension. Now, I've had many people go to those levels, and we've spoken to the light being. But how can you have divinity as long as you are in a physical, solid body? Yes. The experiment was to, to try to create an intelligence being. Somebody who had intelligence and curiosity that they could use to advance humanity. So humanity will eventually get to the point that they won't need bodies anymore. And that's what we're going into now. But it can't happen at the 3D level. That's why we're moving up to the other dimension. I see. Thank you for clar that, Yes, thank you for clarifying that. Yes. That makes sense? It does. It does indeed. I said you could do it here, but... You know, even Jesus had a physical body. Yes. You've talked about uh, there being three waves of soul volunteers who agreed to incarnate onto Earth in order to assist in this transition period, and that they started coming after the dropping of the atomic bombs uh, during World War II. And uh, I was particularly interested in this second group, this middle group, who came after the initial, what you call the Wayshores, but before the wave of the gifted younger generation, some call the Indigo uh, children. The Indigos of the third wave. The third wave, right. So, But the second wave that I'm interested in, you said the job of the second group, who would now be maybe in their 40s, their 50s, was to simply be. The 50s, and that was the first wave. 40s and 50s are the first wave? The 50s, now they're going up into the early 60s because it started about 1945. Yes. The second wave is like 20s, 30s, early 40s in there. They're in the middle group, where the first wave are the children. 
So the yeah. sec the second group you said you've said that their job was to simply be to act as a sort of a a broadcast antenna in order to raise the frequency of those around them. Can, can, can yeah. you tell us more about this second group of volunteers and, and what it means to just be? Be what? How? Well, that's what, I mean, usually people are more interested in the first way. They had the hardest time. Well, let me explain how I came to these conclusions first, and then we'll come back to that question. Because I see so many, many people and I began having lots and lots of people coming to me with the same problem. I don't want to be here. I don't like it here. I don't like Earth. I'm not happy here. Why am I here in the first place? And they say, I don't like the violence. I don't understand it. How can people hurt each other? They don't understand emotions, especially strong emotions. And they, either one, every one of these people will say, I want to go home. I don't know where home is, but I know it's not here. Now, I began to hear this over and over and over again from my clients. Some of them were so upset that they wanted to commit suicide to get out, and they just didn't want to be here. And I knew there was a pattern, because you hear, if you have so many clients, they're all saying the same thing. And it doesn't really go back to their life, because they're having a good life. They just don't like it here. So when we did the sessions, instead of going into past lives, which was normal, they began going to two other places that I'll be explaining. And these are the ones where the volunteers came from. And they all told the same story that they heard, they said, I heard the call. The call went out, Earth is in trouble, who wants to go and help? And some of them say, I stupidly raised my hand. <laughs> and they said, when I get here, what was I thinking of? This is a terrible place to be. But they did volunteer to come. And these are the ones that come in with no karma because they have not lived in a physical body on Earth before. Can you see why this causes problems with them? not wanting to be here. They've never been here before. They don't understand humans. And it's a very, very difficult planet to live on anyway. The other ones are caught on the wheel of karma. They've been coming thousands of years, living the same lives over and over again with the same people making the same mistakes. But the new ones coming in, because they knew that the ones who were on the wheel of karma were not going to be able to help the earth and save the earth. You've got to have another group come in, so they ask for volunteers. And that's why these people have had such a hard time, because this is not where they're supposed to be. They aren't in the regular earth school. So when they came in these different groups, the first wave I said was the hardest. The second group followed. It didn't have as hard of a time because they were following in the footsteps of the first one. But they are here to act as like an antenna, a generator of energy, a transmitter of energy. And the energy comes through them, and it's a very powerful energy. Their job is just to spread this energy to anyone they're around. They can walk through a crowded mall of people and affect everyone that they come in contact with, but they don't know it consciously. If the idea is to spread that energy to help raise anyone that they're around, but they don't know it. So it's one of the, the main questions people ask when they come to see me is, I call it the universal question, eternal question, what is my purpose? Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? And the question is always the same. You're here to help people. Well, these kind of people, they say, you're not supposed to do anything. You're just supposed to be. Your job is just to spread this energy. But I've had them afterwards. One man said, but I want to do something. <laughs> they said, you are doing something by being here. Ah. And that's the difference, but they don't realize what they are doing. The energy is helping everyone they come in contact with. 
But here's the irony of it. These kind of people, even though they're supposed to be help being around people, generating energy, they don't like people. They'd much rather stay home, work out of their house, and stay away from people because they don't like them, don't understand them. That's the <laughs> paradox. Yes. I, it's much harder for them. <laughs> I, I have to admit, uh, when, when I heard you make that comment uh, in, in another program about uh, that being a feature of this, uh, this second group, I thought, yeah, that's me. Uh -huh. <laughs> You're one of those, more or less a loner? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. But uh, I keep on... Wave, a lot of the second wave don't get married either. Yes, I'm, I'm unmarried and, and no children. And so... Uh, uh, See that can with no karma, and they think that maybe having children might create karma. They don't want to be stuck here. They want to get in, do their job, and get out. <laughs> yes, I I also related very much to that 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 sense of I don't know what why I'm here, but uh, something feels awful wrong here, <laughs> and I, I think I need to go home. <laughs> what am I thinking of? I want to go home. Exactly. <laughs> but they're here for a reason because without these people the earth would have been destroyed and it would have been the end because the people on earth just can't do it they're too caught up in their own problems the, the wheel of karma now the ones that are coming in don't accumulate karma they have like a sheath or a covering over their soul to keep them from accumulating karma. Because otherwise they would be stuck here just like the rest of them. Absolutely. So it's a very complex process, and I'm glad somebody else has figured it all out. <laughs> but I, mean, I see so many people, and they're all saying the same thing. You know there has to be something to it. Because they can't all be making up the same story. I'd like to ask you about, uh, in more detail, about reincarnation and uh, what that has to do with the ETs as well. Uh, do our souls tend to incarnate to the same planet, say planet Earth, over and over again? Or do we kind of jump around the universe to whatever planet offers uh, a physical experience providing the best learning opportunity that, uh, that we need? Well, you've been everything and you're going to continue to be everything, uh, even after this. But like I said earlier, when you sign on the Earth School, that's a long school. You can't get out till you graduate. But before you came to this planet, you lived on other planets and had other adventures. Every planet has different rules and regulations. We're the only planet in the universe that has free will. That's what makes it a different experience to come here. I've had people go to planets where they don't have free will, and they're more than happy to get out of there at the end of that. But when you come to Earth, you have to reincarnate again and again and again because you get caught in the karma and have to keep coming back to pay it back. You can't get out of that until you have completed. Then when we're finished at this school and graduate, you might want to go to another planet or another dimension and have different kinds of adventures. Exactly. But this can get complicated if you want to go there. Oh, I do. Parallel <laughs> life. And you can be living this life and also living a life on another planet at the same time. I've had that happen to many of my clients. Oh. So. Because, you know, this is not your entire soul. This is a part, a piece of the so real soul that you are. And it likes to play in these different roles because it can learn a lot more quicker if it's experiencing all these other things at the same time. That's where you have all your past lives and all of your possible lives in this reality. The other dimensions are all occurring at the same time. And I told them one time, that's simultaneous time. And in the beginning, I didn't understand any of this. But as I kept going along, we're getting more and more information. I think I understand it better now. But I said, how can we uh, be 
uh, like our entire life, everything happening at the same time, because we know we go from a baby to a child to an adult. We experience it linear time. They said that's because you aren't wording it correctly. It's not happening at the same time. It's existing at the same time. Hmm. So that makes it any clearer. I don't know. Well, that is... But we're limiting uh, our viewpoint. This is so much bigger than you can imagine. Go ahead. Uh that, that actually got to a point that's always confused me a little bit about uh, parallel realities. Um, I think you've made the point in the past that any time we make a, a decision, be it a small decision or a big decision, uh, one part of us makes the decision that we're aware of, but then every other decision is made by another part of us that's form, that forms a parallel reality. And that sort of makes sense to me, except then I begin to think about, well, what about karma? I mean, essentially, I'm making every choice, good and bad. So why is there any karma then? Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, but that's what it's all about, the lesson. The karma is the lesson. You have to learn everything. But it can get very complicated. I know the first time I got this theory you are talking about, it was mind-blowing. I couldn't understand it. But it means there's energy in any decision. Everything's energy anyway. But if you decide, you're trying to make a decision what you're going to do. Should I marry this person? Should I divorce this person? Should I take this job? <clears throat> Should I go to this school? There's always decisions. I call those crossroads that we come to. And you put a lot of energy into which choice should I make. And you know whichever choice you would choose, your life would be different. So you choose to go this way. What happens to the energy you put into the other decision? It also becomes a reality where another you is living out that, that existence. And, and this is simple way. This is much more complicated than that. Hmm. Because it means that every single time you make any decision, even a small one, it splits again. So eventually, it splits and splits and splits and splits to where there's hundreds and hundreds of you experiencing all these different realities. That's what I mean about it, it can be very mind-blowing. So we're not supposed to think about it. We're supposed to focus on this life and what we've chosen to do in this life. Ah. I've had people who told me they re know they're living somewhere else in another reality, another life, because they can occasionally see themselves. Different family, a whole different different city, and they kind of can see into that from time to time. And they were told, yes, that is another one of their realities. But they aren't supposed to spend too much time there, especially not to try to contact the other person, because that would upset the whole scheme of things. But most people don't realize they are living simultaneously hundreds of lives. Your work has stressed that all humans are, in fact, powerful spiritual masters, meaning that we're actually creating our own reality, even though we may, we're mostly totally unaware that that's what we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. And we kind of believe that, you know, stuff just happens but to us. But um, can individual... Well, Yes. Can individuals learn to take control of that reality creation process while still living in this 3D world of ours? That's what now is all about, right now. The most important lesson that you learn when you come to Earth, that you're supposed to learn, is how to manipulate energy. Remember, everything is energy. The most important lesson you have to learn in the Earth School, how to manipulate energy. Now, what does that mean? Manipulating energy means creating. So you have to learn how to create your own reality. Until you do that, you're definitely not going to graduate. People get caught in this thing, like you said, of, oh, all these things happen to me. Yes. You know, God is doing all these horrible things to me. I'm stuck in this. 
I can't get out of it. And I keep having all these bad experiences again and again, as though some outside force is making these things happen in their life. They don't re realize they are doing it themselves. When you come into the life, you make a plan. You make contracts with other souls that you're going to be together. And you make your plan. This is what I hope to accomplish in this lifetime. But of course, we come in, and this is the only planet in the universe where we forget when we come in. The veil comes down, and we forget everything we wanted to do when we were coming. I asked them one time, wouldn't it be easier if we could remember what our plan was, if we could remember our connection with these other souls? They said it wouldn't be a test if you knew the answers. Mm. So we forget, we have to stumble our way back blindly, trying to discover it all again, to find our way back to the source, because that's where we all started. ETs don't forget their connections, humans do. So that's all part of this lesson. And then the learning, you can create your reality. You can have absolutely anything you want. Nothing is impossible. They say there are no limitations. First, you have to know what you want, and you can create it. It's a law of the universe. See how important that lesson is? Yes, yes. And it's not happening to me. I'm going through these lessons till I figure out I can control it and I can change it. And you can have anything you want. I've done seminars just on that one point alone. You're a great and powerful being that you don't even realize how powerful you really are. Well said. You know, speaking of this time, this uh, this uh, time of shifting, this 2012 era, I've heard you mention that the ex uh, that you don't know the exact details of how this is all going to play out because you've said that a lot of it depends on the choices that we make. And I wanted to ask you, what did you mean by that? Did you mean that the choices an individual makes or the choices that humanity makes overall? Well, it all... Uh, connects together. But the reason they couldn't tell me how it was all going to happen was they don't know. This is the first time this has ever happened in the history of the universe that an entire planet is going to shift into another dimension and another reality, changing the vibrations and frequencies of the entire planet. First time it's ever happened. We're in the middle of it now. They say, when is it going to happen? It's happening now. It's been happening since 2003. Now it's become speed up and it's becoming more and more of a reality. But we are moving into that now. It's not down the road away. But they're not, not sure what's going to happen because it has never happened before. They said it's the greatest show on earth. All the ETs are out there watching us. Well, we're going to be able to pull it off. And they really want us to because so much depends on this whole thing. But you don't sound like you're tied specifically to this December 2012 date. Definitely not. It's just a date. It will come and go like any other date. If everything is happening now. When you remember, I don't know if you remember or not, last October, I think it was toward the end of October, they were saying that was the true end of the Mayan calendar. Oh, yes. The world was going to end. We're going to have three days of darkness. I said, well, I'm going to be in Australia on that date. We'll see what happens. Nothing happened. That day doesn't mean anything. Well, the weather stuff and those things maybe can increase the difference because they're talking about the lineup of the planet. But it's not the end of the world. You Everything are for the better, let's put it that way. But you, it's so gradual, you won't even realize it. You've talked about a literal splitting of the Earth, well, in, in terms of dimensionality, uh, into two different versions, each one being invisible to the other, existing at 
one at a higher frequency of love, beauty, and oneness, while the other would exist at a much lower and darker and denser uh, frequency. Uh, how do you think individuals would experience this splitting? Do you have any idea of like what that's going to be like? I've written a lot about it, and people are always asking me that at the, at the different lectures I give. This is what I mean about the Earth is moving into another dimension, a higher dimension. The Earth is a living being. People don't realize that it is. It's a living being. It's going into its next incarnation. It's evolving and changing. And if we want to go with it, we have to change and raise our vibrations and frequencies to match it. Now, Earth doesn't really care if we go with it or not. We're like fleas on a dog. It would just assume that we didn't go with it. But if we want to, we have to raise our vibrations and frequencies to match it. Now, the splitting is just the two worlds separating. And, you know, we go in and out of dimensions all the time. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. And when you're in the other dimension, you're it's invisible. There's whole worlds around us that we don't even know are there. There's people and cities and everything because it's different dimensions. They're vibrating at different frequencies. They're invisible because, you know, if you watch a fan blade or a propeller blade, how it speeds up, it becomes invisible. Yes. What's happening to these other dimensions? They're vibrating at a different frequency. So as the Earth is moving, it's moving into one of these other dimensions where it will be invisible to the ones on the old Earth. And the old Earth are the ones that cannot change their vibration and frequency fast enough to go. They are into the negativity, and many of them don't even care. They want to be in that. They're, that's the world they want. They want the world where the wars are going on and the crime and the violence and the uh, disasters. That's the old Earth. But some of those people, that's all they know. And they won't go with the new Earth because they can't change their vibration and frequency quick enough. But it's okay. They said eventually, yeah, some of them will wake up and then they will get there. But it's not for any of us to decide. People say, well, what about my family? What about my uh, children? I want us all to go together. I think as a rule we will because we have made that plan when we came in. We plan everything in our lives. But uh, they, you, these other relatives, family, they each one have to make their own decision. We all make our own decision. What are we going to do? Are we going to go or are we going to stay? You can't make it for them. I know some of my, I, I speak at ashrams a lot too all over the world. And at one of those I was explaining this and this my gentle young woman said, oh, but I want to stay with the older. I want to help those people and all of that. And I said, well, it's a very noble thing to say, but when those just Dimensions and frequencies speed up. You can't stay if you want it to. You're vibrating at a different frequency and you're in the other dimension. And they will be invisible. Well, speaking of the uh, this new Earth, uh, can you share any details that you've come across about what life would be like on this at this higher vibrational level? For instance, will our bodies be different, our lifestyles? Will we still have homes and jobs, et cetera, et cetera? You won't even notice any difference. Really? It's everything be happier, peaceful. Uh, at first, a lot of people have asked me, do I have to die to go to the new earth? No. At first, when you go, you will take your physical body with you. And everything around you will just be the same. Your same house, the same people. Except everything will be better, be happier. You begin to notice and you'll say, you know, things seem different. I like this better. You begin to notice it as gradual. It's not just all of a sudden, boom, here we are. That's why it's been gradually happening since 2003 as our bodies adapt 
to changing the frequencies of our body to match this. But after we're over there in the new earth for I don't know how long, then we will no longer have a physical body, and that's when we turn into bodies of light. And by that time, we won't even be having to eat or anything, but that's down the road. But wouldn't we uh, uh, suddenly find that we're missing people that stayed with, the, you know, the people that stayed uh, with the with the old Earth? Let's put it that way. Won't we realize that hey, where are they? What happened to them? Where where's Fred? You know, where's John? That's I get that question all the time too. They said, have you noticed in your own life now, people are dropping out of your life? No. <laughs> Hey, I wonder what happened to John. I haven't seen him in a long time. That it's like that. Huh. I said, told them, well, yes, but you can find them. But they said, yes, but you won't have any desire to. If they're dropping out of our lives, but also we're noticing people are coming into our lives that we haven't seen in a long, long time. So both it's going both ways. Ah. It's like that. It, it just, you know, you won't notice them and you won't even try to find them. It's just a gradual dropping away. So, and, you know, it's all, this is in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, when they talk about the new heaven and the new earth. That's what they meant. And they said in the one part, two men are working together and one is taken and one is left. Two people are sleeping together and one is taken and one is left. That's giving an example. It won't be quite that drastic. But um, you'll just notice, well, like, for instance, in the lecture we say, people say, well, I know that old earth is still there because I see it on TV, the violence, the wars, the catastrophes are happening. It's real. What do you mean? It's, we're shifting away from that's real. But is that your world? Are you living in that experience? We see it because of television, newspapers, but it's not your world. Do you see the difference? Right, you're not experiencing it directly. You're... Yes. I see. Uh, the more you identify yourself with it, it'll pull you into that world. But as we're moving away from it more and more, we're not even going to, to know it. It'll just be gradual. You can't change the frequency and vibration of your body suddenly. It'll be, the whole body would be destroyed. So it has to be done gradually in little steps. And people for all these years, since about 2003, have begun noticing physical effects to their body. And they go to the doctor, and the doctor can't find anything wrong with them because it's nothing physical. It's adaptive to this frequency and vibration because we have to change to match the earth. And some of these can be quite disturbing. I can list some of them if you want me to. Uh, yes, please. Okay, because it's nothing dramatic and they don't last for a long period of time, a few days. And you don't have them all at the same time, thank goodness, <laughs> anyway. But some of the things people have been experiencing, high blood pressure, heart palpitations, where the heart will begin to beat irregularly. And of mm. course, that scares people. Um, dizziness, that's a big one. Depression, joint aches and pains, ringing in the ears. These are all because the body is adjusting to these different frequencies. And they go to the doctor, they can't find anything wrong with them. Of course, the doctor is going to put them on a pill anyway. But you wait a few days, that symptom will go away. Now, I don't know if you noticed or not, the 1st of June, these, these jumps, I guess you'd want to call them, are increasing. They're coming more rapidly. They used to be several months before you would have another, you feel this. The 1st of June, there was a big one. And there was one about the middle of June. I don't know if you noticed that or not. No, I didn't, but I've heard people mention it. Well, with me, it was dizziness. But if you know that's all it is, it'll stop in just a day or so. 
because the body is adjusting to a new jump in frequency. And it can may affect you in different ways, but it doesn't last very long. So if people are aware of that, they'll know, oh, okay, my body is just adjusting to this. That's why the ones on the old earth were vibrating at a lower, denser frequency, a negative frequency, can't change that fast. It's impossible. So they are to stay with that vibration while the others move on. Doesn't mean I am better than you, I'm going and you're not. It has to do with your development over all the lives you have lived, all your karma, what you're involved in now. It all comes to a head right now. Everything is, uh, this is the time of decision, I guess you would say. Everything is accumulating for right now. Do we go or do we stay? So when you go, there's no more karma. That's why you have to get rid of all your old karma or you're not going to be allowed to go. Because if you have karma, you've got to come back and pay it back. The new earth will have no karma. What is, all. once we're on the new earth, what is our purpose uh, at that point? We're still in school, are we not? Or? Yeah. We are, we're okay. More advanced lessons. Mm-hmm. I guess maybe you would say we have jumped into university level, or really <laughs> else are still in kindergarten. Because, you know, you have to learn this lesson now in your life, or you can't go to the next grade. You have to complete that class over again, just like any school. And the universe, they don't care how long it's going to take you to complete that one lesson. You have eternity. But do you want to take eternity to work out one little thing? You're stuck there while everybody else is moving on to college and you're still stuck, stuck in the second grade. That's why you have to work these things out and get rid of all the old karma. That's what holds everybody back. Dolores, you, you said that there was something very important that this that the source wants everybody to know. What 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 what, what is that? Okay. Um, besides the grand lesson of, you know, we have to manipulate energy, they said it was very important for me to get across to everyone is that everything is alive. Everything has consciousness. Everything. Cables floors of rocks, because we've all been rocks, we have been plants, we have been animals. Every single thing is alive. Even in the fibers of the rug are universes. It goes from the microcosm to the macrocosm. You have to understand that everything is consciousness. That's a big leap for some people. And it's, and it's the one consciousness, correct? It's we're all really part of a singular consciousness, are we not? We are all one. We're all part of God. What you may call the source, God or the source, we are all one. We started with that, and when we finally get finished with all our schools, we will go back to the source. And source is total love. Well, I think that's a perfect place to, to, to end the interview. Um, I know that you have a uh, Convoluted Universe book four is out. Tell us about yeah. that. Okay, because you know, these are big books, if you remember, the Convoluted Universe series. Last year was the first year I did two books in one year. Usually I do about one a year. I wrote the Three Ways of Volunteers, and then the Convoluted Four came out in November. And it has more of these mind-bending concepts in it. Every time I think I turn it all, <laughs> they give me another concept. They'll make it even more mind-bending. So my work doesn't cease. I'm now, right now, working on three more books. Because convoluted four, I had to take out 300 pages. It was getting so big. So that's the basis for a whole new book. But I'm never going to quit writing. I have tons of material that are always challenging our minds because that's what it's about right now. We've got to expand. We've got to learn. This is what this time is about. 
I'm amazed at how much energy you have, Dolores. You're just a dynamo. <laughs> <laughs> I travel all over the world. Speaking um, of that, uh, you have a conference coming up on the 13th and the 15th of July, correct? Tell, tell us more. Yeah, next week, it's sneaking up on us pretty fast. That's here in Rogers, Arkansas, and the John Q. Hammond Center, which is the largest venue in Arkansas. This is our seventh one that we have done. It's a transformation conference. And it, I, it started it as a showcase for my authors. So they would have a way to get out there and speak. But some of them had never done lectures. It was to promote the new authors. But we also have famous people that come to speak at each one of these conferences. This one is July the 13th to the 15th in Rogers, Arkansas. Our keynote speaker this year is Arun Gandhi, who is the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi. And he's also one of my authors. We publish his book. But also, Dee Wallace, the movie star, she was the mother in E.T. Yes. She's going to be here. She's going to make a special guest appearance. So we're going to have a wonderful list of uh, lineup of uh, speakers. And it's going to be a really good three days That's for that. That sounds fascinating. Uh, how, how can people keep in touch with you uh, and uh, keep up to date? You have a... Uh, a website, I'm sure, and is there a newsletter or? Well, the website will have all the details, and newsletters do go out to our mailing list, you know, our email. But if they want to check on the website, make it easier without going to the company. You just type in my name, DoloresCannon.com, and it will bring up the schedules and all of that. Because after the conference is over, the end of July, I go to Europe. And I'm going to be out of the country until October. And we're having our first transformation conference. It's going to be in London. Oh. We're going to bring it over there. And that's going to be the end of August. And during August, I'm, see, I'm teaching my method everywhere. I'm having huge classes. I'm going to be having classes all over Europe. And then we'll return the end of October. Then I, for a week, I have to go to Istanbul for the largest UFO conference in the world, and then I go back to China. I'll be home for Christmas, maybe. <laughs> Dolores, <laughs> I, I, fact, we're, we're planning to have an Ascension party on that 21st of December. Yes. We're going to have an Ascension party in London. Hmm. We'll see if anybody have... disappears from that party un unexpectedly. <laughs> on that day. But right now, we're pushing the uh, Transformation Conference for next week. So there's a lot of things going on, and it's a very exciting time to be alive. Absolutely. Dolores, I wanted to thank you again for being so generous with your time and for sharing the extraordinary information with our audience. Uh, as always, we invite our viewers to leave comments and questions on the Soul Adventure TV website or on YouTube or Facebook. And please feel free to share this video that you're watching. This information is meant for everyone. So until next time, this is Steve Crow, your host, wishing everyone an enlightening and fulfilling soul adventure of their own. Bye-bye.